Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation. Don't freak out, Harry Potter is still coming, I'm just doing a few other things first. Y'all ready to get love crafty and up in here? H.P. Lovecraft was an author who lived around the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries and was one of those unfortunate souls that was never really appreciated in life but found colossal worldwide fame after his death when he couldn't enjoy it. To this very day, he's still considered one of the forerunners in the field of fictional horror. An attempt to talk about all the influence his work has on modern popular culture could potentially take up an entire video, so I'll simply summarise it by saying, he's the guy who invented Cthulhu. Oh, you suck. Cthulhu? Oh. You know what? I'm not supposed to be able to pronounce it. I don't have the right organs. Right, I should probably start by clarifying that the 2001 film H.P. Lovecraft's Dagon is not based on H.P. Lovecraft's Dagon. It's based off H.P. Lovecraft's The Shadow Over Innsmouth. All of my attempts to research this name change could only uncover one potential reason for it. It sounds slightly cooler. To be honest, even saying it's based on the shadow over Inn's mouth is seriously pushing it. It's just close enough that if they claimed it was an original screenplay, I would have furiously accused them of plagiarism, but it is so off on its own tangent, I would have liked to invoke the in-name-only clause, but can't for obvious reasons. Right then, well, here's my thoughts on the book just as a book. I can see why H.P. Lovecraft still has a massive following to this day. The skill with which he wrote his work and the eloquent poetry of his word choices is almost Shakespearean. His stories range almost exclusively from short to too really short, and the shadow over Inn's mouth is no exception. Despite this length limitation, he does a remarkable job of setting up his stories and satisfyingly concluding them at the end. I do, however, have three notable complaints about his work. The first is that Lovecraft was, unfortunately, famously known for being a bit of a xenophobic white supremacist, and you can totally tell from his books, the casual racism of all his characters is unmissable. The second issue is that, reading his books from a 21st century perspective, I probably didn't get as much out of the descriptions of his monsters as someone in his time would have. He sets it up really well, there's almost a whole page of describing how the hero finally plucks up the courage to peek out from his hiding place and have a look at the hordes of monsters trying to find him, how the hero says that that first glance at the fiends from the deep was his last truly sane moment in life, and how he was never the same again, how the horror he perceived was almost indescribable, but he shall try so you too can understand his suffering. They were, they were, they were fish people. Yeah, pretty much fish with arms and legs that lope down the road making scary noises. I don't know, I think maybe it's a combination of my generation being so jaded by an overabundance of movies trying to scare us, and overexposure to a concept. Like how the alien from Alien started out as a thing of nightmares, but within a few decades everyone was so used to seeing it, it lost all its intimidation. The third issue is, uh, sorry, major spoiler warning, the narrator of The Shadow Over Inn's Mouth describes his final descent into madness and his transformation into a fish person at the end of the book. The problem is, this means he didn't even start writing the book until after he was already loony and half monster, making me question that he would be able to write down his original feelings of dread and horror he felt during the events of Innsmouth. As a final fun fact for you, Lovecraft himself apparently was very, very disappointed with how the shadow over Innsmouth turned out. Apparently he shared my own bad habit of being intensely critical to the point of disgust with his own work. In this case, I'd have to politely disagree with him and endorse the shadow over Innsmouth as well worth your time and an excellent starting book if you're looking to give Lovecraft a try. Okay, and here's my judgement of the film just as a film. This film is not good. It's cheap, it's corny, and it somehow gives off the impression of trying too hard and being lazy simultaneously. Made in 2001, Dagon is actually a Spanish film, but it's performed in English with an American lead. It received a lacklustre response in Spanish theatres and only a DVD release worldwide. I can see why. The acting is poor, the effects are embarrassing, and it's rife with nonsensical plot holes. I can see why they were so keen to display Lovecraft's name front and centre, as I'm pretty sure that without association to his legacy, this film would have faded into even more forgotten obscurity than it already has. Seeing as the not-read-the-book results are a little high on this one, I'll give you a quick run-through of the plot before we start. The story is narrated by the protagonist many years after the main events of the story occurred, and he starts by describing the destruction of Innsmouth at the hands of the US government, who investigated the place at his behest after he spent a horrible night there. The narrator goes unnamed in the story itself, but apparently the title Robert Olmsted has been discovered in Lovecraft's notes on the subject. I shall refer to him as such in this to save effort. Robert explains that, in 1927, as a 21-year-old student with a strong passion for architecture and antiques, he was travelling through New 
England and by chance discovered an incredibly fascinating tiara in a museum. It was made from gold, or at least a gold-like metal, in a fashion he'd never seen before. By asking the locals, he finds out that it's from a nearby town called Innsmouth, though they all warn him not to go there because the residents are both physically and mentally very strange. Ignoring their warnings, he travels there by bus to see if there's any other ancient trinkets he can find there. Upon arrival, he discovers that the residents are indeed very unusual, having deformed features and skin. The town itself seems a rather dark and ominous place, and Robert notices that the church has had its Christian markings replaced by some other unknown religion. The only relatively normal seeming person in the town is an alcoholic old man who Robert plies with whiskey in exchange for the backstory of the place. The story turns out to be rather more fantastical than expected. The old man, named Zadok, reveals that in the preceding century a resident of the town, a sailor by the name of Obed Marsh, had discovered on his travels a tribe of island-dwelling aborigines who worshipped an amphibious race known as the Deep Ones. It seems that in exchange for this worship, which involved an abundance of human sacrifice, the Old Ones provided the tribesmen with a ton of gold and kept their waters teeming with all the fish they could eat. The aborigines were eventually persuaded to trade their gold with Obed and teach him the Deep One's religion. The economy of Innsmouth prospered with this new gold trade, but that ended when the island tribe and their Deep One friends got wiped out by their neighbours, who apparently had taken offence to all the pagan worship and human sacrifice. Captain Obed apparently decided that the best course of action was for Innsmouth to start worshipping the Deep Ones themselves, and even goes as far as to make a human sacrifice or two. This was just a tad over the line for the local authorities, so they locked him and his followers up in jail. Unfortunately for them, it turned out the local Deep Ones were quite looking forward to having some new worshippers, and they attacked the town in force, taking over and installing Obed as the new boss. He set about converting all the churches into Deep One temples, and explained to the local women folk that it was not only possible to breed with the Deep Ones, it was also now mandatory. The hybrid children born would apparently look human at first, but as they aged they would start to take on more and more Deep One features. Once they reached a certain point in their development, it was apparently possible for them to go and live under the sea, where they would stop aging and live forever. This had become the norm now in Innsmouth for quite a few years, so pretty much all of the town was now populated with early stage hybrids. At this point in his story, Zada completely loses his shit, pointing out to scene, exclaiming that they'd seen him giving away all their secrets and he was now doomed. He tells Robert it's probably too late for him as well, but he should try to leave the town right now anyway. Robert, convinced that this poor old man is simply a couple of tentacles short of an elder god, is unconcerned, taking his time walking back through the town and making notes on the unusual architecture. He only starts to worry when he's told that the only bus out of town was out of commission and he was going to have to spend the night in a local hotel. He finds that his room has a lock but no bolt, and with the foreboding nature of the place combined of Zadok's story finally taking effect on him, he installs one himself. This turns out to be very fortuitous as it's not long into the night when someone attempts to quietly unlock his door and get into the room. Realising that he is in imminent and genuine danger, Robert escapes the hotel while they're still trying to get in and flees into the night. Pretty much the entire population of Innsmouth starts trying to hunt him as he tries to find his way to freedom. Being a smart and quick-witted man, he manages to make it to the outskirts of the town. He realises there's a large body of people approaching and manages to hide himself. He then discovers that the Deep Ones themselves have mobilised to try to stop him, and it's at this point in the story that you get the before-mentioned lack of payoff with his description of these monsters. So overcome with horror was poor Robert that he fainted dead away. Fortunately for him, his hiding place was not discovered, and the next morning there's no sign of the Deep Ones. He makes it back to human civilization and makes enough of a fuss that the authorities are forced to start an investigation into the town, leading to the before-mentioned explosive results. The story does not end there, however. Robert goes on to explain that many years later he decided to do some research into his own personal family tree and was horrified to eventually discover that he not only had strong ties to Innsmouth, he could very well be directly descended from Captain Obed and a Deep One female. He starts to have vivid nightmares of civilizations under the sea and old relatives he thought were dead but had apparently decided to seek immortality under the waves. He also notices physical changes start to develop on his person, making him resemble a resident of Innsmouth. He concludes the story by admitting that he strongly considered suicide, but the idea of living for eternity with the Deep Ones had grown on him, so he was going to go back to the remains of Innsmouth and swim down to the depths of the ocean to his true home. Right then, let's see how much of that made it into the film. Pretty much everything that I'm about to mention is qualified with a but afterwards. Obviously said buts will be discussed in the next section. The general concept of an isolated town that's fallen under the sway of an old god worshipping cult due to the actions of a douchebag sailor captain years before, and an outsider inadvertently interloping into their business is admittedly the basic setup of both plots. There's also a chase for a hotel and the protagonist repurposing a bolt for his door. Though it was added under time pressure in the film, and was clearly so small it wouldn't have held anyone for more than a second there. They also stuck to the sole bastion of humanity 
humanity in the town being an alcoholic mess of an old man who witnessed the original takeover firsthand and is in a pretty bad state because of it. Interestingly, the summoning of the Deep Ones using a lead weight dropped into the water is also a book original. One thing they were wise enough to keep was the unsettling way that the residents of the town tended not to blink. And the film also kept to the book's final plot twist that the lead was unknowingly descended from both a resident of the town and the amphibious monsters that bred with them, and that he would eventually spring gills and decide to live under the water with the monsters. Okay, as far as I can see, that's pretty much it. Moving on. The first thing you notice about the film is that the tone it takes is very different to that of the book. The book takes its time to build up extreme tension before it commits to anything truly scary happening directly to Robert, and saves the reveal of the truly supernatural stuff until the end. The film starts with a shipwreck and jumps straight into the action shortly after. While it's not specifically mentioned, judging from the laptop and the type of cell phone they had, one can assume that the film was set in the early 2000s. This makes the existence of a completely isolated town in a first world country a bit more questionable due to the wonders of modern transportation and communication. In the film it appears that Innsmouth has been moved from New England, USA to the coast of Spain and now bears the name Imboca. This is the first time I've seen another country stealing the limelight away from America instead of vice versa. The protagonist of the film is definitely not even trying to be the same person as the book. Robert is, as mentioned earlier, a learned, reserved, intellectual architect with a complex vocabulary and a surprisingly cool head in a hot situation. The film's hero Paul is a high-pitched, whiny, immature, complaining, bumbling jackass. If you've ever wanted to see a horror movie starring Professor Frink from The Simpsons, you're very much in luck with Dagon. I don't find any of this enjoyable. Rumo, please help. Oh, 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 there's gonna be a beautiful sunset. Well, <laughs> that's great. Yes, uh, my car seems to have broken down, and I was wondering if I could use your. Oh, that's a pushing motion. Robert's backstory and profession is made very clear in the book, but Paul's job is almost annoyingly vague. The opening dialogue essentially boils down to, You sure are a genius, Paul. I'm very glad you made all this money doing the thing. Paul makes continuous references to probability and possible outcomes, suggesting he might be involved in the sciences in some way, though he also makes a reference to computer coding and has to check on the stock market regularly. Also, apparently a rich British guy is investing in him in some capacity. Apparently, Paul works as a science computer man doing smart stuff. In the film, he also brings an alter with him to the village. There's the incredibly hot Spanish chick who's inexplicably attracted to annoying nerds named Barbara, a rich British guy named Howard who's investing in Paul's... Uh, idea, invention, company, thing, and Howard's wife, Vicky. While I did mention earlier that the lead did eventually become one of the half-humans, half-fishmen at the end of the book, the process took years to take effect, not fucking hours like it did in the film. The one and only thing I could potentially say was a slight improvement in the film was that they foreshadowed the lead's connection to the town with his dreams and even some clever stuff like him mentioning that his mother forbid him to learn Spanish as a youngster. In the book, it 100% comes out of nowhere in the final chapter. Two things that feature quite heavily in the film that have no basis in the book whatsoever are boobies. To facilitate this change, they introduce three new female characters. Barbara and Vicky I've mentioned already, but there's also Erxo, another descendant of the Deep Ones who believes it's her destiny to procreate with her brother Paul and have lots of nasty-ass monster children. The manner in which the lead comes to the town is also completely different. What lessons the book provided about the dangers of an abundance of curiosity and not heeding warnings is completely erased because they're forced there in the film by accident due to a shipwreck. The film added in a rather gory human skinning and face removing element that didn't feature in the book. Thanks for that, sickos. While the old man and his backstory made it into the film, he goes by the name Ezekiel now and hangs around for a lot longer than he did in the book, teaming up with Paul and the others trying to escape and then getting horribly murdered by the other locals. Because they sort of skipped over the backstory of Obed's tribal friends, the film had the town's influx of gold literally just come out of the sea with the fish. Now I can't say definitively because I'm not a massive Lovecraftian fan, but I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have approved of the multiple jump scares in the film. It also included a shit ton of straight up gore horror and the pinnacle of its lack of subtlety took the form of a tentacled hybrid trying to swirly pull to death. I'm not kidding, these guys really looked at the work of Howard Philip Lovecraft and decided eh, it was good, but it could really be improved with a death by toilet. There's also a new film-only climax where Barbara is sacrificed and Dagon turns up in person to devour her. The sudden and very brief appearance of this monster god thingy is the only connection this film has to the book it's named after. As opposed to Robert, who buys a gun but then decides not to attempt suicide, when he discovers his heritage, Paul goes through with his plan to off himself, dousing himself in flammable liquid and setting himself on fire. He's pushed into the sea before he dies, and his horrific burns don't seem to bother him once he's underwater. As I mentioned before, he completes his fishy transformation pretty much all in one go in the film, and goes from, I'd rather set myself on fire than join you, to, okay, I'll come swim into an underground precipice if you just lead the way, in a matter of seconds. So yeah, pretty much every scene in the film, even the ones that were relatively closer to the book, all have massive changes in them. Moving on again. 
I mean, you can probably pretty much tell for yourself just how much of the book didn't go into the film from the disparity between the length of its description and the what they didn't change section. There were, however, a few particularly memorable omissions. To my disappointment, the ending the film went with, where the lead turns into a slightly crispy fish man all in one go and swims to the underwater kingdom without ever leaving the town meant it was impossible to include the part of the start of the book where the narrator describes what the government did when he made it out of the town and alerted them to the goings on there. Exactly how much the officials learned about the Deep Ones there and how much they may have already known is never made clear, but apparently what they found in Inn's mouth was enough for them to feel inclined to blow up the fucking town. They pretended they'd found bootleg alcohol there, bearing in mind this was set during the Prohibition, and blew that motherfucker off the face of the map. What makes it even fucking better is they then sent a military submarine to find the underwater city and blow that up too! Fucking hell, I just don't get it. Jurassic Park, The Shining, Dagon? How is it that the books always seem to be ending on kick-ass explosions, but the films, the visual medium, chooses a more subtle route? Although, to be fair, in this case, it could have just been a budgetary constraint. They don't really cover in the film that the Deep Ones claim that they could, and probably would soon, rise up and take over the surface world. They tell Robert in his dreams that while the submarine's torpedo attack had hurt them, you could never really destroy the Deep Ones, and next time they were going to try taking over a much, much larger coastal city as their invasion's starting point. The Dom's final thoughts. This adaptation is so all over the place that I can't even tell if they were just trying to make a generic horror flick and stole Lovecraft's name and story for credibility, or if they were genuine fans of the book and were just way too low budget and generally incompetent to do it justice. Regardless of what their intentions were, what they ended up doing was taking Mr. Lovecraft's story and drowning it under as many modern horror movie cliches as they could find, but then they still proudly slapped his name on the opening title and put the last line of the book at the end. They took a dark, chilling, slow-paced tale of horror and turned it into a half ass action flick, and I personally think it's an insult to Howard Lovecraft and, quite frankly, a bit of an embarrassment for Spanish filmmaking. Die-hard Lovecraft fans might get a kick out of seeing what few elements of his work made it into the film, but I kind of suspect the rest of it would be too much of a drag factor to be worth it. Until next time, my very beautiful watchers, peace and love! Craft. I'm funny.